Hey everybody, Dr. Brad Bodo here. Hope you're having a wonderful day and thank you for joining me in this week's video where we tackle all of the lab markers that I like to get checked when we look at a full thyroid panel. We'll begin our discussion by first looking at the difference between standard lab ranges and optimal lab ranges. Then we'll check out each thyroid marker individually, talk about what it means, look at the normal range for that marker in particular, and that way, if any of these numbers are coming back abnormal for you, you'll have a little bit more context and understanding and know what steps you need to take next. So if that sounds like a good plan, make sure to hang with me throughout the entire video for all of this good information, or feel free to skip around to the markers that interest you the most. Either way, I appreciate you being here, and if you could, just a quick reminder, please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you like it, and also subscribe to the channel. I make videos on the best natural strategies to help you improve your Hashimoto's and hypothyroid symptoms, and I post them every single Thursday morning. Not only do I really appreciate you interacting with the channel, but it'll also remind you when new content is available. But as I said, let's get started today by first looking at the differences between standard lab ranges and optimal lab ranges, which are also known as functional lab ranges, because we're gonna be referencing both here in just a little bit. Now, standard lab ranges are typically established in one of two ways. Either they're a statistical analysis of the average of people going in and getting a particular marker tested, or there is some sort of governing body that says, you know, these markers are what we feel are healthy, and therefore anything above or below it is something that needs to be flagged. An example of the statistical analysis would be a marker like TSH, which ranges between 0.45 and 4.5. And an example of an established norm from a governing body would be something like cholesterol. Anything under 200 is considered to be healthy, while anything above it should be flagged and checked on. The reason why standard lab ranges are so important is because they are the benchmark for diagnostic criteria. If we don't meet specific parameters, then we can't say someone has a particular condition. And obviously, this makes sense to most of us, and you have to draw the line somewhere. But the problem that a lot of us run into is, what if you haven't met that criteria, yet you're still having symptoms and not feeling your best? Well, what that usually leads to is you continuing to feel that way, because your doctor isn't going to take any action until you get to those black and white endpoints where they say, okay, we can now match this particular treatment to what the lab results are telling us. Which again, makes sense, but this doesn't take into consideration the problems that you're struggling with right now. And this is where the optimal or functional ranges come into play. Yes, the standard ranges are important, but what if your body's a little bit different and those standard ranges don't do a good job of telling us exactly what's going on? Well, instead of basing everything off of the averages, functional or optimal ranges takes a bit of a narrower view and tries to create a lab range based off of function and research and can give us an idea of what is actually going on instead of having to wait until your body gets so bad and out of shape to where it's now outside of the standard lab range. But I do wanna make a point here and be extra clear. If you are outside of the optimal range, that doesn't necessarily mean that anything is wrong. Just like the standard ranges might not fit you 100%, the optimal ranges also might not tell us the whole story. Additionally, we cannot diagnose with these optimal ranges. The standards are the standards for a reason. And a pet peeve of mine is when a patient comes in to see me and they've seen another practitioner who focuses more on the holistic and natural side of things, and they've been told that they have hypothyroidism. But when we actually look at their previous labs, they didn't have elevated TSH, they didn't have low T4, they just had trends in those directions, which may or may not be important for them and their health. And so when I do discuss these things with my patients, that's how I talk about them. The optimal ranges gives us an idea of trends, and trends need to be associated, one, in the context of all of the other markers around them, and two, in the context of your symptoms. So optimal ranges can be great at helping us to understand the mechanism behind your symptoms and where we should start offering support, but they're not 100% black and white diagnostic, and they shouldn't be treated that way. 
So just keep in mind that when you're looking over your lab results, the standard lab ranges helps you to identify whether you have a disease or not, but it doesn't give you a lot of information on your symptoms, meaning you can be within the normal standard range and still be feeling poorly. On the other hand, if we're outside of the optimal range, it doesn't 100% mean that there's a problem there, but if there's a collection of markers that all seem to be trending in an abnormal direction, then it may be something that we wanna look further into in context with your symptoms. Both standard and optimal ranges have their own pros and cons, and we just wanna be aware of what those are. But let's get into all the markers that I like to see on a full thyroid panel, and we'll start with TSH. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, and although this is a common point of confusion, it's not actually a thyroid hormone itself, it's actually released by our brain. The job of TSH is to bind to our thyroid gland and increase the production of thyroid hormone. In general, if TSH is elevated, that's due to the fact that our thyroid gland isn't working properly and isn't making enough hormone. This is also tricky because since a lot of people think that TSH is a thyroid hormone, you would think that high TSH would mean high thyroid function and low TSH would be low thyroid function, but instead it's the inverse. If TSH is low, it's generally due to thyroid hyperfunction, either from something like Graves' disease or a hot nodule which is producing too much thyroid hormone, or because someone's medication dosage is too high, or because the brain isn't working properly itself. We have to have good brain health to have good hormone output from our brain, and if something is interfering with the function of our brain, then it's going to impact its ability to release TSH. The standard lab range for TSH is 0.45 to 4.5, but in general, I like to see it between one and three. Our next lab markers are the total hormone quantities, including total T4 and total T3. For thyroid hormone to be moved around the body, it first has to be bound to a transport protein, and the vast majority of T4 and T3 is found in this bound state. Total T4 and total T3 is a calculation of all of the bound hormone and also the free hormone. Since most of T4 and T3 is bound, by checking bound and free values together, it gives us a really good idea of how much production is being generated by the thyroid gland. The standard range for total T4 is 4.5 to 12, with the optimal range being 6 to 12. The standard range for total T3 is 71 to 180, and the optimal range is 90 to 180. Next is free T4 and free T3, which is the unbound versions of T4 and T3. As I said, the vast majority of these hormones is bound, and only about 0.03% of T4 is free, and 0.3% of T3 is free. This is why we look at total T4 and total T3 to get the best idea of the gross production of our thyroid gland. But that doesn't tell us what is available to our cells, and that is the purpose of the free values. It's all fine and dandy to make a bunch of thyroid hormone, but if it doesn't get to where it needs to go, then it doesn't really matter to us. And bound thyroid hormone is inactive and unavailable to our cells. So even though our free values are a super small percentage of the total, they're important because they're the ones that actually bind to and activate our cellular metabolism. The normal range for free T4 is 0.82 to 1.77, and I like it to be between 1 and 1 1.5. The standard range for free T3 is 2 to 4.4, and the optimal range is 3 to 4. And real quickly, because I get this question all the time, I'm going to reiterate the point I made before, which is that if your free T3 is below that optimal range, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. And it also doesn't mean that if you get it up into that normal range, that things are going to be better for you. Those changes have to be assessed with the T4 levels, both free and total, our TSH, and also your symptoms. But remember, many times it's not always the quantity of thyroid hormone that's the most important aspect to how we feel. Instead, it's all the other things around it that dictates how our body uses it. So yes, the numbers are important. Yes, they help us understand trends, but your body is much more complex than just the values on the lab set. Our next two markers are ones that are definitely less commonly checked, 
but I think provide a ton of value. And the first one is T3 uptake or T3U. Now I've already done a big, long, extra in-depth video on T3 uptake. And if that's a marker that's been abnormal for you, definitely check it out and I'll link it for you up above. But the short and simple answer is that T3 uptake is a proxy marker for the amount and availability of transport proteins, specifically thyroid binding globulin. If thyroid hormone production decreases, then there's going to be more thyroid binding globulin available without any thyroid hormone. That causes the calculation of T3 uptake to go down. So because of the way that the transport proteins interact with thyroid hormone, low T3 uptake can be reflective of hypothyroidism. Additionally, if there's too much thyroid hormone being created, then that will cause the reverse effect on this calculation and we will see T3 uptake elevate. So in its simplest sense, T3 uptake is merely a reflection of the activity and function of our thyroid gland. But there are other factors that can change those binding globulins and therefore change the results on our test. Thyroid hormone production might be normal, but if there's an increased amount of thyroid binding globulin, then that will also cause our T3 uptake to be suppressed. The most common cause of this is increased estrogen levels. Sticking with that same theme of normal T4 and T3 levels, if there is a decreased amount of thyroid binding globulin, then usually we see T3 uptake increase. And the most common cause of this is due to elevated testosterone levels. And I realize there's a lot of this is up, so this is down, back and forth there, and I know it can get a bit confusing. So just remember the results aspect of it, which is T3 uptake is suppressed when thyroid function is low, or if thyroid function is normal, but we have an increase in estrogen. T3 uptake is elevated when thyroid function is high, or if thyroid function is normal and there's a decreased amount of thyroid binding globulin, which is commonly caused by increased testosterone. The key is to correlate your TSH and T4 levels with what you're seeing on the T3U. The normal range for T3 uptake is 24 to 39, but I typically like it to be between 25 and 35. Our next marker is reverse T3, which is a byproduct of the process where our body converts T4 into the active version of T3. Reverse T3 is the mirror image of its active version. And for this reason, it can't fit or bind to the cellular receptors like active T3 does. Kind of like your left shoe, although it looks the same as your right shoe, doesn't fit on your right foot. And the creation of these proteins that are mirror images of their active form is something that is normal in our body. However, if we start to see too much or too little of this reverse T3, then it suggests to us that either we're not converting enough T4 into T3 in the first place, or there's something wrong with the conversion process itself. If we're suspicious of issues with thyroid hormone conversion, then I not only like to look at reverse T3, but I also like to compare T4 levels to T3 levels. If T4 levels look fine, but T3 levels are trending low, then that's another indicator that conversion could be an issue for us. The standard range for reverse T3 is 9.2 to 24.1, but I think it's reasonable to look at it between 12 and 24. And finally, the last two markers are the antibody markers, which includes TPO antibodies and TG antibodies. Elevated levels of one or both of these markers is reflective of thyroid autoimmunity. Most commonly, TPO and TG antibodies are associated with Hashimoto's, but they can also be positive in Graves' disease. Hashimoto's is one of the most common causes of hypothyroidism, and these antibodies can develop many years before someone is diagnosed. And it's for that reason that it's critical that these antibodies are included in your thyroid panel and are a part of your overall thyroid workup. The normal range for TPO antibodies is 0 to 34, and the normal range for TG antibodies is 0 to 0.9. There are no functional ranges here, but if someone has a mild elevation of antibodies that is still within the normal limits, and they have a family history of autoimmune conditions, have other autoimmune conditions themselves, or haven't responded to standard approaches or treatment, then I may still approach it as an autoimmune situation because of all the suggestive evidence. Additionally, it's estimated that about 10% of people with Hashimoto's are seronegative or that they have negative antibodies. 
So it's definitely possible that these kinds of situations exist. But once again, we want to look at the totality of the information and have that dictate our next steps. So to quickly recap, the markers that I like to have included on a patient's thyroid panel include TSH, total T4, total T3, free T4, free T3, T3 uptake, reverse T3, and TPO and TG antibodies. Having all of these markers allows us to really assess what's going on with your thyroid pathway all the way from your brain down to your cell. If we can identify your particular weak links and look at how these different markers are playing off one another, then we can be much more specific with our treatment and approach, and ideally, your healing can be more complete and long-lasting. Of course, if you have any questions, you can leave them for me in the comments box below, and if you feel like you need additional help, you can send me an email at contact at seattlethyroidhelp.com to request a free one-on-one -on -one consultation to see if we would be a good fit to work together. The consultation is absolutely no pressure, and it simply gives us some time to discuss what's going on with your health, figure out if it's something that we can help with, and explain what that process looks like. From there, we make a decision on the next step together as a team based on what is best for you. Even if you're not interested in the consultation, but you have some questions, you're welcome to use that email to reach out and get in touch. But that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and remember to do all the good things like like this video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and come say hey on social media. Links for Instagram and Facebook are down below. I hope you have a great rest of your week. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel and I'll see you next Thursday.